Thanks to Surfshark for sponsoring this video. Find out more later in the video. Hey, 42 here. Henrietta Lacks was born in Roanoke, Virginia in 1920, just two days after women were given the right to vote in the United States. Hers wasn't an easy life. Her mother died giving birth to a tenth child when Henrietta was just four years old, and her father, unable to cope with such a large family on his own, divided his children out amongst whichever relatives were prepared to take them. Henrietta was working out in the local tobacco fields from an age that would be illegal today, and she dropped out of school in the sixth grade to help support her family full time. She had her first child at 14, and four more would arrive over the following 15 years. Tragically, at the age of just 31, Henrietta passed away. She had lived a short, hard life, and for many years her name was forgotten to all but those who were closest to her, her friends and family. But little did they know that Henrietta Lacks hadn't really died at all, at least not exactly. And what was more, in the years since her non-death, this unassuming woman had been busy changing the world, playing a pivotal role in some of the most important breakthroughs in medical science of the entire 20th century. You see, whilst Henrietta may have lived a pretty unremarkable life, she most certainly wasn't your average woman. In fact, Henrietta Lacks was a mortal, sort of. If you love traveling, then you'll love the fastest and easiest VPN, Surfshark. Did you know Surfshark helps you to avoid price discrimination based on your location? So you can save money on plane tickets and car rentals whilst traveling. Surfshark runs on any device, anywhere and it's packed full of features, such as industry-leading uncrackable encryption, IP and DNS leak protection, an internet kill switch if your VPN drops out, and 24-7 customer support. Personally, I use Surfshark to watch Netflix content from other countries, such as the US, that's usually blocked here in the UK. Surfshark maintains a strict no-logs policy and their network of 3,200 servers in over 65 countries runs completely on RAM, so they couldn't even log your data, even if they wanted to. By using the code 42, you will benefit from an 83% discount plus three extra months for free. All you have to do is click the special link in the description below. Don't miss it. To tell this strange tale, it's probably best if we start at the beginning of the end, of Henrietta's life, that is. Back in early 1951, when she was 30 years old, Henrietta felt what she described as a knot in her womb. She'd already had four children by this point, and her family suspected the feeling of discomfort was the first sign that baby number five was on the way. As it happened, they were right. But after giving birth to a son, the unsettling feeling in Henrietta's belly didn't go away. Which is how, soon afterwards, she found herself sitting in the waiting room at Johns Hopkins, the only hospital in the area that would treat black patients. Henrietta was seen by Howard Jones, who in later life would go on to establish a reproduction center responsible for the world's first so-called test tube baby, but at the time he was a young doctor at the start of his career. During his examination, Dr. Jones, Dr. Jones calling, sorry, we got carried away there, discovered a strange mass of bleeding tissue on Lack's cervix. Unlike anything he'd seen before, he took a biopsy for testing, and when the results came back, they were unequivocal. Henrietta Lacks had cervical cancer. She was treated with radium tube inserts, which are exactly what they sound like. But the cancer was so aggressive, it continued to grow and spread faster than radiation could kill it. Before the year was out, Henrietta had passed away. But during her treatment, unbeknownst to Henrietta herself, two further tissue samples were taken from her cervix. One of healthy cells, 
the other cancerous. These were sent to Johns Hopkins cell biologist George Otto Gay, head of the hospital's tissue culture laboratory, and it was in Dr. Gay's lab that something truly remarkable happened. Gay had been trying to culture cervical cancer cells for years when Henrietta's samples arrived on his desk, and he knew the challenges involved better than anyone. Even inside our own bodies, human cells only go through so many divisions, usually between 40 and 60, before cell division ceases for a phenomenon known as senescence. This cap on the number of times a cell can divide is known as the Hayflick limit. In his lab, even if Dr. Gay created just the right conditions, he was lucky if he could coax more than a handful of generations of cell divisions out of his cultured samples. Before long, no matter what he tried, the cells would die and he'd need to find a new sample to work with. At least, that's how things usually went. It soon became clear that Henrietta's cells were different. Because, far from dying out in his carefully constructed cultures, the cancer cells taken from Henrietta's cervix thrived, dividing over and over again long after they should have perished. And that led Dr. Gay to a rather startling conclusion. Henrietta Lacks' cells were immortal. This discovery was a big deal. Like a very big deal. You see, an immortal cell line, one where the cells continue to divide over and over again, apparently forever, offered researchers something they'd never had before, an unlimited supply of uniform, genuine human tissue that was cheap to produce en masse in a lab and could be used to carry out all manner of experiments. Such a cell line would eliminate the need to laboriously collect tissue samples from patients, and since the cells could be cultured in a lab, there was none of the ethical concerns that might have been associated with testing on tissue that were still attached to the human who'd made it possible in the first place. By the way, I should point out that in the human body, cancer cells aren't affected by the Hayflick limit. They can continue dividing over and over again, though this wasn't understood until the 60s. And anyway, outside the body, in an artificial culture, it's a very different story. And much like regular cells, cultured cancer cells soon die out. But for some reason, Henrietta Lacks didn't. And it was a game changer for biological research. Dr. Gay knew exactly how important this discovery was. And so he began handing out the cells which he dubbed Gila, after the woman they came from, to anyone who wanted them in the hopes they would be used to make breakthroughs in many areas of medical science. And it wasn't long before Gila cells were doing exactly that. In 1953, it was found that Gila cells could be reliably infected with polio, one of the world's most feared childhood diseases allowing scientists to study the disease at scale for the first time in history, which directly led to the development of the world's first polio vaccine. Taming polio was one of the first scientific breakthroughs made using HeLa cells, but there have been so many since, there's no way I could possibly list them all in this video. HeLa cells have been used to study the effects of radiation on human tissue, they were blasted into space on some of the very first rockets to investigate the impact space travel might have on our bodies. They were crucial to the development of IVF. And they have been vital tools in the research of a whole host of different viruses, including HIV, HPV, Zika, herpes, measles, mumps, and yes, even COVID. The cultured cells of Henrietta Lacks were the first ever mass-produced human cells, and the first to be cloned. They have been central to the establishment of more than 11,000 patents, the writing of more than 100,000 scientific papers, and the winning of at least five Nobel Prizes. By some estimations, over 20 tons of HeLa cells have been created over the years, 
and they're still going strong to this day, 70 years after Henrietta died. It's no exaggeration to say that healer cells have changed the world as we know it, and saved innumerable lives in the process, all of which is pretty incredible, I'm sure you'll agree. But there's another side to this remarkable story, one that's rather less rosy and a whole lot more complicated. You may remember I mentioned earlier in the video that tissue from Henrietta's cervix was taken without her knowledge or consent before being sent to George Otto Gay's Human Tissue Culture Lab at John Hopkins Hospital. Which, when you think about it, is a little concerning. I mean, healer cells were fueling research all over the world, and yet Henrietta's relatives had absolutely no idea that the living tissue of their nearest and dearest was being used and, you could say, abused in this way. It would be some 25 years before they found out. In the meantime, their lives had been going on pretty much as they always had been. The unsavoury irony here is that whilst Henrietta Lacks cells were enabling medical research that would go on to make pharma corporations millions, perhaps billions of dollars, members of her own family didn't even have enough money to pay for basic medical care. I should point out that no crime was committed here, or at least nothing more than a moral crime. The doctors of Johns Hopkins Hospital were under no legal obligation to ask for permission to take Henrietta's cells, and no companies or individuals who made money from their work with healer cells owed the family a penny by the letter of the law. Taking human tissue samples without consent was completely standard procedure at the time, and even today, material obtained from a patient during surgery, blood and tissue samples say, can be used for research in much the same way Henrietta's was. I'm sorry to tell you that in the relatively unlikely event money is made using your bits and pieces after surgery, you aren't entitled to any of it. This was actually tested in the California Supreme Court back in 1990, when a man named John Moore, who suffered from leukemia, discovered his cells had been turned into an immortal cell line, much like Healer, and later commercialised by his physician. Unsurprisingly, Moore wanted a slice of the very big pie, but the court ruled on the side of the physician, making it clear that an individual has no rights to his own discarded cells, and no rights to any profits that may later be gained from them. Intuitively, it feels wrong that our own cells could be used in this way, without our permission, for the profit of others. But is it just as easy as saying we should have to give express permission in order for someone to use our body parts for research? Your reflex answer to that question may well be a resounding yes. So was mine. But is it really that simple? What if scientists came across a person whose cells had some unique property we could use to cure cancer, let's say? enabling research that may save millions upon millions of lives. If that individual happened to be a bit of an arsehole, who quite liked the idea of sticking two fingers up at the rest of humanity by refusing to let scientists get their latex gloved hands on his valuable cells, should he be allowed to do so? Admittedly, it's hard to say how realistic that scenario might be, but it certainly gets you thinking. Then there's the fact that the more bureaucracy you add to a process like obtaining human tissue for research, the more time it's going to take. Something that poses a bit of a problem, since living human tissue has, unsurprisingly, quite a short shelf life. Add too much red tape, or seek too many approvals, and we might risk missing out on making medical breakthroughs that could save lives. As is often the case with complex moral conundrums, there really are no easy answers here. Though I think pretty much everyone would agree it's wrong that Henrietta Lacks' family were left living in poverty, whilst her cells were busy changing the world and making others very rich in the process. So clearly, 
something needs to change. Healer was the world's first immortal cell line, and to this day, it remains the most important and the most widely used cell line in biological research. Healer is no longer unique. Many other immortal cell lines have been developed since, but it's still very much remarkable. Henrietta Lacks cervical cancer cells are so robust and grow so aggressively that they're able to easily outcompete most other cells, even other immortal cell lines. And in the 70s, scientists began to realize that many cultures of what they thought were immortal cells from other lines had, in fact, been taken over by rogue healer cells. Cross-contamination of cultures is incredibly hard to prevent. We're talking about human cells here. Objects so tiny they can happily float from place to place on a moat of dust. And healer is so hardy so fast-growing and downright dominant, if just a few cells drift into a nearby culture, more often than not, they soon take over. Remarkably, it's estimated 20 to 30 percent of all immortal cell lines have been contaminated by healer cells. And that's more than a minor inconvenience. It essentially invalidates every experiment conducted with the contaminated cell cultures. And since most researchers traditionally haven't tested the identity or purity of the cell lines they're working with, we're talking about a vast amount of research that's being called into question. In stories told by those who knew her in life, Henrietta Lacks was a fun-loving, caring mother who found happiness despite the hardships she faced. In death, she unwittingly became one of the most influential people ever to have lived. Hers is a story that mixes tragedy and triumph, but none of that takes away from the truly monumental impact this unassuming woman has had on the modern world. Henrietta Lacks may have lost her life to cancer, but in a strange twist of fate, that very same cancer made her immortal and changed biological research forever. Thanks for watching. Check out my new podcast, Random Interesting Facts, available on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and anywhere else you get your podcasts. Link in the description below. Thanks.